Welcome. We are grateful that you have joined us on Facebook. Uh, we have to apologize. If you tried to join us this morning, you noticed that we had some technical difficulties. That difficulties that happens in this time. But we are so glad that you're here with us now. And uh, we are grateful for our sponsors who bring us this virtual seminar, which is Cedar City Brian Head and Tourism Bureau. And Richard, I am so excited for this group of people that we have here. We get to celebrate a group of people who we don't often get to see, but we see their work all the time. And in fact, uh, that's why we're kind of doing this, this, uh, this session, because we want to talk about those people who we don't often see. So uh, who have you got here with us this morning, Richard? Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm Richard Gertain. I'm the production manager here at the festival. And like Michael said, I'm really excited. We're getting to talk to people who, uh, who, who usually don't get the spotlight. So um, Hopefully all of you will get to learn a little bit about them and about what they do, uh, both at the festival and uh, at large in the uh, live entertainment industry. Um, I'm gonna give you a little brief introduction to everybody. Um, first, uh, we have uh, Kelly, who's joining us from St. Louis, right? Is that where you are currently? Yep. Um, Kelly is uh, one of our prop supervisors. She works in the Engelstad Theater since 2012. She's uh, been working with the festival. Um, I'll let her explain what her job is, but just to give you a little more background about her, she's um, she's done she's worked at almost every theater or performance <laughs> venue in St. Louis. It sounds like um, props manager at Repertory Theater of St. Louis, adjunct faculty. She's an educator as well, Conservatory of Theater Arts at Webster University, um, prop manager at Opera Theater of St. Louis, prop master at Stages St. Louis, all the things. So thank you, Kelly. Welcome. Um, also joining us, uh, who works in our Ingolstadt Theater also, is Chris Winneman. Uh, Chris is our uh, one of our technical directors. Um, again, I'll let them explain what, what that means. Um, Chris, uh, this would have been, we're saying this is going to be the third season. We're going to count 2020 since we did a whole <laughs> lot of work for it, even though it didn't get to be produced. Um, Chris is currently um, the Clinical Associate Professor of Technical Direction at Arizona State University. Um, area head of for design and production. Um, he received his MFA from Missouri, um, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, he was a TD at a lot of theaters, Creed Repertory Theater, Orpheum Theater Center, Auburn University, Scottsdale Conservatory Theater, whole lot of places, whole lot of experience. Um, love structural mechanical design. Be interested to hear what that is uh, for everybody. And, uh, you know, automation and lots of general theater practitioning. Um, our third guest is uh, Jenny Stanjeski. Uh, Jenny and I work together at Juilliard um, and uh, she is a scenic charge um, and she received her BFA in theatrical design from Carnegie Mellon University, um, working mostly out of New York. She's currently at Cobalt Studios in upstate New York and I'll let her talk to you about what that is. Um, has worked off Broadway, has worked at Lincoln Center. Like I said, she was she's at Juilliard currently. Works at uh, has worked at the Manhattan Theater Club. Um, is a proud member of uh, USA uh, Scenic Artist Union 829. Um, worked at Showman Fabricators, which is a commercial scene shop, um, and uh, has has also been all over the place doing all kinds of things. So welcome each of you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to turn it over and get a little and, and get get to hear you know how did how did you all get into theater and into you know sort of the disciplines that each of you uh, have have sort of gravitated towards. Um, Jenny, can you can you start us out? Sure. Um, when I was in middle school, uh, one of my friend's friends was in a community theater production of The Music Man, and they went and helped paint some scenery. And well, I was bored because they I couldn't hang out with them. So I went and having spent many years holding my father's flashlight, when I was given a job, I did my job. And I ended up like painting six tires and they were still on their first and I was an eager beaver. So uh, the set designer there in Red Bank, New Jersey, Phoenix Productions still exists out there at the Count Basie Theater. Um, Jackie took me under her arm and I spent uh, four years, four summers pulling scenery in and out of a parking shed in the middle of summer, sometimes by myself with Home Depot paints uh, from the oops pile uh, and just building up a lot of enthusiasm. 
uh, so much so that they let me into Carnegie Mellon. And I majored in design because, gosh, I mean, I love design and I really thought that that was the path that was the most professional to take, I think. That was the next step. That was the aspirational next step. But um, as I came to the city and uh, learned about my day-to-day -day energy and flow, uh, not being physical during the day and then going home at drafting at night was just not what my body and my hands wanted to do. And I ended up really wanting to paint things and make things, still working and collaborating with designers. but. Uh, I've been slathering liquids onto solids consistently for 30 years now, and there's nothing I like better. Um, when I finished college, I came back to New York and took uh, about six to eight years doing Broadway, off-Broadway theaters. I mean, running around, juggling them like you do when you're a young scenic artist. You get the overnight calls until you earn a little bit of respect, and then you get the show. And... Um, I ended up uh, joining the union after I was sort of needing health insurance, basically, and uh, was at Manhattan Theater Club until like so many regional type theaters in New York, they closed their shop. Uh, lucky for me, uh, John Lee walked me a few blocks from Manhattan Theater Club over to Showman Fabricators and uh, I got to work there for a while. And when I was good and burnt out, I went to the Juilliard. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lot, and, and I want to really, I do want to go back and touch on sort of the hustle that you talked about. I hope we can touch base on yeah, that. Yeah, the we hustle. The hustle's real. Um, Chris, can you, uh, can you give us a little bit about how you got to theater and to technical direction? Yeah, uh, so a lot like Jenny, I started in middle school also. I wanted to get out of my last two periods of class so I could be part of the tech crew <laughs> at middle school. I was like, hey, why not? I get to get out of class and go do something kind of fun. Uh, and then from there, it went into high school and I just kept doing it there. And I was like, hey, why don't I try to make a career out of this? And I went to undergrad and I looked for a college that had a, a fairly small program because I was not a great student and I needed a lot of like direct connection with the faculty and being lost in a big body of people just wasn't good for me. Uh, a lot of people are very successful in that. Uh, and the program I went to, I went to Viterbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, they had amazing facilities, amazing faculty. I got a lot of, a lot of experience in all the different areas. When I first entered there, I was a sound technician. I wanted to be a sound uh, engineer or designer. But when I got there, I realized I have slight hearing loss, which is a, a problem for anybody in sound. So I was like, cool, I need to pivot. And, and I'd always through high school been working in lighting and scenery. And then I really discovered costuming also in undergrad. So I was trying to work in all of the areas, but I found my real passion in like moving large things and building large scenery because uh, I'm, a, I'm a larger guy and I can move large things pretty easily and doing really <laughs> delicate things just was not was not my my forte. So I really like using my hands to make things. Uh, so that just really led me down the technical direction route. And after and after undergrad, uh, I bounced all over the country, uh, going from theater to theater, uh, taking any gig that I could get anywhere, just doing the hustle, tr trying to get enough experience and enough respect to like have a big enough credentials to get uh, other big full-time jobs. And then I did that for about, for about a year, I was jumping around and then I got the job at Auburn University being their staff technical director. And then from there, I started a theater company in the middle of Iowa, undergraduate training pro or a, a community college training program. Uh, and then from there, I was like, I understand technical direction and I understand the basic rules that we use to build scenery, but I want to understand what those rules are and how I can morph those rules to build the things that the designers want instead of dealing with the square shapes. So I was like, I need to go to graduate school to learn more about structural and mechanical design so I can understand statics. Uh, uh, static math and mechanical math so, so I can start doing bigger better things and and that's where I went to grad school I really focused on that structural mechanical design and and project management so I can have good flows through our shops and how things are going to work and then from there I applied for a bunch of jobs was almost hired as a lead rigger on a cruise ship but then the job at Arizona State University popped up uh, and I was like hey this is awesome I really love educating and working with students and, and helping shape 
what the industry is going to be in the future. And in education, I found that, that was the best way to shape where the industry is going by sending well-educated students out. So I've been at our, our, here at Arizona State University for the past seven years, uh, and we've been really pushing a lot of new digital technologies with 3D scanning, CNC routing, 3D printing, uh, and just really trying to push the envelope because we can do that in education. We can take uh, leaps of faith, and if it doesn't work, it just doesn't work, and there's no consequences to the larger company. We can we can try these things and educate our students on forward thinking and what the next innovation is going to be and how to push the industry forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And then from here and connections through grad school and working in all the different venues I have, I made a connection with Utah Shakes, uh, and then I was hired out there to be the technical director two seasons ago. Cool. So that's kind of my path. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Kelly, same question. How, how did you get here? <laughs> I got into theater as a dancing building in a production of Annie. My sister <laughs> was Molly and I was too old to be an orphan. So I got roped into being on stage crew and we were dancing buildings. We had little flats that we walked behind the set for NYC. And that was my first theatrical experience at a community theater in Corinth, Mississippi. Corn mm -hmm. Theater Arts, it's still running to this day. Um, and from there, I did everything on stage and behind stage all through high school. And I actually went to college to be a technical director because I thought I wanted to build scenery. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I really don't like building scenery. <laughs> I like all the little tiny things that Chris hates. I like trying to figure out all the weird magic things. And I like learning about a different thing every day and I don't want to do the same thing every day. So I jumped into the world of props my sophomore year in college and never looked back. Uh, so from there I moved to North Carolina and propped out there and then came back to St. Louis and have been propping in and around St. Louis for years and then came out in 2012 to Utah to work with Ben and have done almost every space out there. I haven't gotten to do the Ains yet. I really, at one point, I'm going to get to do a show in the Ains Theater, so. Cool. All right, we'll let Ben know. <laughs> That's great. I mean, I think what we see here is that, you know, different, there's something for everybody in theater. You know, there's 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 a little piece that will, uh, uh, you know, you'll find your niche and you slide back and forth at different times, maybe in your career, as I have. I've, I've moved around from different positions as well. So I think we all kind of do that. Um, I, I want to make sure people understand what you do, like what your jobs are. Cause I don't think, I, I mean, we hear these things and many different places have different titles and titles are also evolving now, which I think is good. You know, we're, we have some, we have some old names for positions that the job is essentially the same, but we're, we're, we're being a little smarter about how we talk about them. Um, I, I'd love to throw it, Kelly, to you, what is, what's a prop supervisor? Maybe give us a little bit about the evolution of that too, would be great. At the festival, I am in charge of the props for one space. So I will be in charge of all the props for the shows in the Ingolstadt Theater this, this coming season. So I will work for Ben Holman, who is an amazing props director who oversees everything. And he looks at the big picture of all the shows, but then I look at the big picture of those three shows. Mm -hmm. And then we will have artisans and carpenters who will actually get to make everything. So I will look at with the I will work with the designer and the director to get exactly what they want everything to be, and then we will interpret that information and give it to the carpenters and the artisans to actually produce everything. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, just to back up, what's a prop? Okay. So when <laughs> just when <again. laughs> people come on tours of my space, this is the way I like to describe it. I like to say that if a moving truck comes to your house. Everything that goes on the moving truck is a prop. Now, and it's different in every theater, but for the most part, all of your furniture, all of your curtains, all the food in your refrigerator, your refrigerator, all of that would come from the prop shop. Now, at the theater that I work at right now, the plumbing is also a prop. All the light fixtures in your house that are not, you know, lighting the scene, those are all props. So all the lamps and all that all comes from the props department. So yeah. there's a lot of, we do a lot of different things, which is what makes it fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chris, this is loaded. I mean, there, there are as many definitions as there are technical directors. So tell me what, what is, what is a technical director? 
roughly. What is a technical director? Historically, uh, recently it's been evolving in the past 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Historically, the TD was the person who oversaw all departments and kind of oversaw safety and how everything went. But as scenery got bigger, got more detailed, we started throwing automation in there. The job has kind of refined to become a little bit more precise uh, in dealing with the, the estimation the uh, structural mechanical design and the drafting of how the scenery is going to be constructed. And then uh, in a lot of shops, they lead the carpenters in the purchasing of materials to make sure that things are getting produced. And then from there, it gets delivered to the paint shop to, uh, to paint the scenery. So it's, it's getting more refined as the skills needed are starting to increase uh, to, to produce big scenery safely. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think one of the things, especially Utah is one of the very few places that, that I've worked where um, we label what is many times traditionally called a technical director, a scenery director or a scenery supervisor um, to kind of really focus it in to be like, this is a scenery centric position rather than someone who oversees all the different tech technical elements. Yeah. I think to your point, Chris, it's um, uh, it, things have gotten complex enough over time that you know somebody to, to sort of look over all those different elements um, needs more specialization. Uh, so technical director can be a misnomer depending on, you know, where you are, like just like you said. Yeah. Um, Jenny, scenic artist, scenic charge artist, or what, what are some other terms? Tell me about it. I yeah. mean, it's really, uh, I love putting them all in there. Scenic charge artist. When you go around the table and people are like prop shop supervisor, costume shop supervisor, and I get to say, you know, charge scenic artist it's really i would say the least innovated role in theater um we work with what we'll say is the scenery supervisor i usually call them a technical director but i like that niche description right so basically chris and i would work together uh at, we would discuss with kelly what was a prop and what wasn't a prop maybe wrestle a little. And then uh, Chris and I would work with the designer, the same designer as a team, uh, to pull together the structure and the aesthetics in order to put something on stage that works well together. And then I would be in charge of developing all of the application, all of the surface preparations, uh, working with the designer, uh, in a rather romantic studio way. They come to me, I paint up some samples, we talk color, we talk light, occasionally we talk with the lighting designer. And um, then I run the scenic artists and I choose which scenic artist is gonna be best for the project. And uh, we all work together to uh, get that done. I would say that the thing that has innovated the most over the last, and it's really only, I would say, my 30 years as a scenic artist has been we've come all the way from dry pigments and glue, all the way through latex paints, theatrical paints, and now we have catalyzed floor finishes, and mm. things are a lot healthier. Mm. Cool. Yeah. And if I can, so it, uh, yeah, yeah. If if I go ahead, sum up what you're going to say, and then I'll ask my next question. Go ahead. Well, we paint, we spray, we decorate, we carve, we coat, things like that. Cool, cool. And uh, I've known it as sc as scenic charge. Uh, where did the word charge come in? Do we know? You know, I'm not quite sure, but it could come from movie culture, which I've only done a little bit of. Um, it's uh, because there are there are charges who are sort of overseen. Sometimes there'll be an art department lead, which would be someone who might take care of more budgeting and right. scheduling and meetings. Uh, oh, yeah. And maybe in this world also handle, I mean, when you get to movies, then it's drafting and scene design in a whole nother world, but we're gonna stick to theater here. Mm -hmm. uh, our department might also handle graphics that are new now, printed matter, stuff right. like that. Uh, but then you have your scenic charge, who uh, is in charge of the shop, mm -hmm. which would be the painters, 
uh, painters with more experience with our, which are leads. And then in the union, you would call them an industrial. Uh, in a non-union shop, you might call it a shop person. And that's the person who has their own special set of skills and techniques that they use to keep the shop running. So you sort of, you're helping all those people work together. Cool, cool. Yeah, there's a there's sort of a there's sort of a thing about each of your jobs. I think that depending on the size of the shop or the scale of the things you're working on may not be obvious, but there's a maker manager component to a lot of these positions where you're you're supervising people, but you're also an artisan as well. Like you're you may actually fabricate things. You may like if it's specialized or something. Um, I, I don't know. Is that true for you, for some for you all? And 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 can you give an example of how that how that kind of works? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I mean, being an artist, I mean, a lot of people see technical directors as a craftsperson because uh, I like to describe it as I take a pretty picture that the designer has made, I break it down to a bunch of numbers, and then I recreate it into full scale, <laughs> real size things. And a lot of people see that as a craft, but there's a real art to it of material selection and how do I adjust this design to fit the realities of what our budgets are, our time constraints, uh, and getting really creative on how I can engineer this. Uh, in order to make the job easy for the charge artists, in order to make it so that we can afford it, we can get it done on time, and then it's easier for the crews to install and take it off, because at Utah, we do repertory theater, so the sets have to come down and go back up, and then how do you creatively make that easy to go up and down uh, is, is what's really artistic about it, and I really love doing. Cool. Cool. Jenny, anything? I think maker, oh, uh, yeah, maker manager to me is like, uh, you know, when I'm doing a sample, I'm in my head of colors and words and dry times, and I'm thinking, and I'm not usually using words, and I'm in my own world. And when I'm in manager mode, I can step back and see problems that I wouldn't see if I were right on top of it. Uh, and so I need to make sure to sometimes be in manager mode and sometimes be in maker mode and sometimes switching is hard. If I'm sizing a drop and someone comes in from the office to ask me a budget question, I don't know what to do. <laughs> spin that, spin your head around, spin your hat around. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off, Kelly, sorry. No, you're fine. I was just going to say that I feel like at Utah, especially the, all of our preseason work kind of puts us in that managerial role but then once we're there and in person and on site it gets a lot more fun for me because some parts of the day I get to go and help out and actually make something which is great and for me I normally do a lot of helping out in the soft goods room so I'll help with sewing curtains and upholstering chairs and that kind of stuff which gives me that creative outlet that I don't get when I'm stuck at my computer all day looking at budget numbers. Mm -hmm. uh <sighs> It's it's early in the it's early in the seminar to ask this question, but I think because I know all of you now, it's going to go deep here. So it's two parts. Uh, I want to know what if someone wants to be Jenny Kelly or Chris, um, what would you recommend them doing? So I'm talking both training wise, going to school and all that type of stuff, and I'm also talking broader skill wise. The question number two, though, which is where I want to go deep on this, is you all manage staffs and you see people coming in with skills or not skills. And you, you go, wow, this person has a future here. I wish they would have known more of this or I wish they had more of this and I, they don't have this. Type of thing. And I, I actually think you're in a unique opportunity to not just, you know, take a bunch of classes. We're not talking about that. There are there are set skills that, that we see the industry kicking us that are in deficit, that we go, man, I wish they had this. And then we see other ones that we go, wow, if only, if only we could have caught somebody at an earlier age to train them this way. So I'm asking, it's the big question, how do we become Kelly, Jenny, and Chris? But I'm also, what, what do we wish the industry was doing and what can I as an individual do to make sure I get hired by Chris, Kelly, and Jenny? Who wants yeah, to take so, uh I can jump in that so, sort of the second point and then I'll go to the first point. Uh, the, the thing that is crucial is uh, attitude 
and your willingness to learn and try new things and not be so stringent on the way you think. I can teach you how to screw a board together, or use a table. I can teach you how to use any tool and construct anything, but it's very hard when you come in, we have such a short period of time together if you don't have the right attitude and if you don't have this openness to explore different things, because we have lots of problems laid out in front of us and we have to think very creatively in lots of different ways in order to solve those problems. So if you're very linear thinking, like I can only do it this way, because there's a, a ton of different ways to solve any problem, being able to be open to that. And then always having that positive attitude and just coming in and being a pleasant person to work with and be around and just have that uplifted spirit just really enhances everything. And you're just a lot better to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of that, how did I, uh, what skill sets as a technical director? I mean, the big things is, is understanding math and being really good uh, at understanding uh, things from an analytical point of view, uh, being able to break scenery down, understand that things kind of fit in a linear motion and, and understanding the structural uh, components behind it. Because we put very large things on that we ask actors to stand on top of and then perform. And we don't want them thinking about, is this gonna fall down? Is this gonna break? Is it wobbling kind of weird and I feel uncomfortable? So that's where the structural design comes in and understanding those mathematical uh, formulas that go into it in order to create safe environments for actors to be in so they don't have to think about it because they have to remember their lines, not trip over their costume, hold their prop, remember where they have to walk from point A to point B, and they don't need to be worrying about, is this platform unstable? <laughs> cool. Kelly or Jenny? I want to echo what Chris says. I want people who want to learn. I want people who want to try new things. I don't want a robot that comes in and can only do it one way. I mean, in props world, we never know what we're doing that day until we get the notes from rehearsal the day before. Mm. And I always want to try a new process on how are we going to do it this time. So if you can think outside the box, that's who I want working for me. Mm -hmm. um, as far as skills, I mean, there are some skills in, pro in props, especially that are really the dying art. So we have upholstery and sewing are things that are not being taught in our high schools anymore. And we've also got a lot of um, woodworking, welding, all those skills are great in the prop shop. Electrical and wiring, plumbing, all those little, we are the jack of all trades and the masters of none in the prop shop. So like I can figure out how to do something today that I had no idea how to do yesterday, but I'm going to figure, I'm going to learn it. I'm going to figure it out. And that's what I need is someone who's got that willingness to learn and willingness to learn a new skill mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Cool. Cool. Jenny? Oh, Mike. There we go. Uh, I'm gonna just another one for insatiable, that insatiable curiosity that you're talking about and the joy of sharing that like inescapable curiosity with each other. I think that's what makes work fun is that I just, I want other people who think that I think that, that like that think that what I just thought was cool is cool. And that who also want to celebrate my work and I want to celebrate their work. Like those to me are, that's the, that's the goods, that's the flour, egg and water that I want to start with. Now, when we say how to get to where we are, I think it's really important to mention how privileged and white the theater community is. And the problem is, is that Votech is not being pushed into theater because all of these things, Kelly, that you're talking about, these are all Votech trades and they take skill and they take art, but they are not connected to theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we really need is more than one way to get in. And one of the ways I try and open up my scenic art world is that there is the undergrad way to go. And side note, side gripe, all of these small colleges that do not prep people for a theater career, but give them a theater degree, take their money, put them in debt, and they don't yet have the training to go to grad school or get a job. That's a problem. Put that aside. Moving on. But we'll so come back to that. To We're going to come back to that. <laughs> oh, good. 
Good. So moving on, I see two ways that people come into the scenic art trade that work. And uh, one is very age discriminatory. You go to undergrad and you do your summer stock. You spend your 20s busting your ass. You get some more clout 30s. By the time 40s, you're pretty OK. You're in the union or you're doing OK. That's a fit. You're in New York. And if you're not, you got some good regional jobs that you're hopping about or you're taking a smaller but vibrant theater city and you're wrapping it around your finger. The other way you go about it is you go to school for any of the arts and you have great rendering capability, you understand color and you understand light and you hustle during your 20s to just get food on the table and make your rent. You've shown you know how to work and you show you know how to render and then you run into scenic art and you hopefully get matched up with someone who understands stage left and stage right and you know drop shadow and you get taught together in the same class and you both bloom that's that's my plan excellent thank you um go yeah, ahead go ahead richard go ahead no, I, I was just gonna i was gonna change to something slightly different michael go ahead if you had a if you had a follow-up well, i i i don't know if we want to run down the rabbit hole yet but i i would love to talk about that the industry you know, how, how we can open up the industry. Because I know, uh, Jenny and I just met, but I know Kelly and Chris, and I know you have people working in your shops that are just like what Jenny just described, who are either this, you know, that you found through a college, or you, you know, found up here or found that, those, those type of ways. So um, uh, let's say we could change the industry. Um, or, uh, and presently we are, Chris, you talked about how, you know, here there are certain things that we're doing on the college level, Kelly, also within your school as you're teaching. Uh, they, the whole world's trying to talk to me. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you wish we could do training wise to, to get students who really wanna do this in, into these fields? Uh, so, so when I enter or eight years ago, when I decided that I wanted to go into education, because I wanted to help change the industry and being in the industry, I wasn't able to make a lot of change, like actually this being a TV somewhere. So I thought if I went to education, I could start educating students. And what I identified there is in the technical director field, specifically carpenters in the shop, there weren't women, like women weren't in that field. So I was like, I want to promote a shop that makes it an open environment for these women to feel comfortable being in there. But as I entered education and learned, it's like, it's a bigger problem than just that uh, with people of color and BIPOC people just not being represented in theater at all. And, uh, and one thing that we're working on at ASU is it's a financial barrier. It's like, I can't afford to go do this hustle and not make rent and not, it, like, they just don't make enough money to participate in it. So trying to break down that financial barrier so that they could either get into college and be successful there without that huge financial debt burden or do vocational or go into those kinds of things that are cheaper than going to a university. I see it a lot as a financial barrier that a lot of people don't have access to the training to get this. Cool, Kelly? For me, it's more about getting to them early and letting them know that this is an option. I feel like a lot of the kids are not being exposed to theater in the schools. Mm -hmm. And if we can get at them and let them know that it's not just you can be an actor on stage, but you're really good with your hands, I've got a job for you. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that that is coming across as a viable career field to these other communities that are not as exposed to theater as some of the white communities are. Cool. Great. And Jenny, anything else? Yeah, I think that we need to get uh, unions and producers to understand how Votech training and how uh, theater and arts training really is the funnel to get them more powerful, larger ranks. And I think they need to put money into promoting sponsorships that get high school students to get to go to Broadway shows and regional shows. And we need to get the technical side of theater, not just the, the arts grants need to not just go to sort of acting side and production and, and like what you're doing right here is part of it, but younger, like Kelly says, we need it to be younger. And uh, I wish that there was some way to like, you know, if, how do Votech schools get 
to high school students. Uh, they advertise, right? Now here at Cobalt, where I'm here this week, this is a two-year program, which is, you know, could be considered a VOTEC. Anyone who comes out of this school after two years, I'm definitely hiring. It's concentrated conservatory school, but it's put down at the bottom of the rung, like it's what you do if you can't make grades. And we need to change that perception. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just want to, you know, it, Jenny and I, when we were, when I was working at Juilliard, where we had this conversation a lot, and it was one of our dreams about, about vocational training. And while some people, you know, the, the undergraduate graduate training programs are vital and are sort of are, are the core of a lot of the training in this country, not everybody can go or is meant to go to a traditional uh, Western style university. And their skill sets don't go that way. And a lot of our, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm gonna go a little bit down the rabbit hole here. Um, a lot of our deficiency as an industry, as a country in some ways, I think is the, is the opportunity for people to get trained in skills, technical artistic skills in a different environment. Something that we, we try to train people based on their learning. How do they learn? How do they become um, you know, productive productive members of society, we have to, as a society, can we find other ways to serve them? The vocational training programs, the idea of, of really focusing a conservatory uh, style to balance these great undergraduate and graduate training programs that really rely on a more sort of traditional Western style um, uh, university training program. So balancing these things out and then getting to it again, I think the early part, like talking about getting to the students when they are young, when they are in third grade, when they are, you know, if I didn't have a community theater opportunity, if I, because there, I didn't have school uh, where I went to, where I went to high school and middle school, I did not have any theater classes, and I had a really great community theater that I didn't have to pay for. That I was just, I went in the door and they said, "You want to do something? Come on in." And that opportunity for me to get in there, and it was just because the community I was in was integral to me to getting inside of this business and that was, that's the exception, not the rule, um, that that opportunity existed for me. And it certainly doesn't exist in a lot of, uh, in, in, you know, my community, I live in a very, you know, middle-class privileged upbringing and, and I had that access and a lot of people don't. So just to echo everything everybody's saying, I think it's, well, and I, we got to start I, earlier. If someone had told me that 45 minutes ago, this is what the conversation was going to be about as we're, I, I, this is not where I was planning on going, but I'm so glad we went there. I am asked on a regular basis, my son, my daughter is interested in going into theater. I, I don't know what to do as a parent. I am so, uh, as if that that's a curse, as if that that's a, not knowing that it is a viable career, a great career. And, um, uh, I haven't said it on here yet. Um, you know, everyone says, you know, they're going into the army and we just think of the soldier. We don't know that the army is composed of multiple lawyers and cooks and band and machinists and mechanics. Uh, uh, everyone thinks of NASA as the astronaut on the moon, not knowing that there are thousands of people with highly skilled jobs down in Houston to put them up there. The theater is exactly the same. We got that one actor on stage and you got seven people supporting that actor with huge skills and very, very intelligent uh, and, and highly, highly passionate and artistic with life skills that could go into any profession. We just happen to choose theater here. Yeah. And, um, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I just, I, I wanted to say that like, even if you, any theater person, I think it could walk into a multitude of other jobs. I think it's really important to be like, you can have a theater, you can go into theater training, your, your son or daughter or whatever, your child can go into some sort of art and that art is going to make them better at anything else mm -hmm. they do, yep. anything sure. else, because we are creative problem solvers. You know, the idea of coming in with a, with a, uh, a good attitude, an open attitude, no is the worst word to me in our business. It's not no, it's what else, let's fi figure out how to do it. And all these people here live that every day. And if you have to move and balance and the hustle of, I mean, nobody works harder at just trying to like get those theater jobs and then try to find a new, you know, find another avenue for them to go to, to, to then make a living. And they have skills that transfer between all these different things. So I just wanted to be like- And yes. show me a computer programmer who knows what a deadline means. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> right. right? I think the one piece of the puzzle that we're missing here, like it's great to encourage these students to go into vocational and those kinds of things, but producing organizations value a degree over the vocational training. So a lot of places I've gone to as a TD, they expected me to have a master's degree in order to hold this job. So if we can, producing organizations that are doing the hiring, if they can reprioritize that vocational education is just as good as a formal piece of paper that I spent years getting, and it's just a piece of paper. Yep. So if we can break that down to say that that it's okay not to have that piece of paper. I do think it's- Yeah, I don't have it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think it's important to say uh, what Tanya Searle, our uh, production stage manager, has just sent a beautiful message to. She said, uh, now in the time of COVID, we want to do the jobs that we've spent years training for, too. So there are highly, highly skilled people who have been in this industry forever who are just uh, who've got multiple skills, but want to do what they want. Uh, they, they don't just want to go out and do something else. They're trained. And, and obviously, as a society, we need that. Um, I, want to, I want to change gears and take us out of this beautiful change the world uh, conversation and, and talk about what we actually do on those stages. Um, uh, you know, we call this setting the stage. So I'm, I'm going to frame this in what is one of the most unique challenges in your field that you had to fix or solve that you're really, really, really proud of. Um, so I'm thinking props, I'm thinking, you know, technical direction, I'm thinking this, what is an obstacle that you had to overcome and you did it and you lived to tell about it and, and shared that story? What is, what's something so that, so that our audience can wrap their heads around what do these people do? I think we do a lot of the magic tricks. So we do in the Tempest, we had the, the floating, uh, Prospero came up from the trap with his cane on that magic seat that everyone loved. And what you don't know is that I had to upholster the underside of his stool so that it looked like his pants were sagging down below him. And so the he audience was raised was up. All around him. They had no idea. He came yep. up and they didn't know how that effect happened. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, other things like we did that. Um, oh, now I've lost the word for it. The remote controlled tumbleweed <laughs> for the comedy of errors that rolled across the state. Like those kinds of crazy things is what makes props so fun is because it's like, oh, OK, we'll figure it out. Yeah. 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 Cool. I mean. I mean, last year for Book of Will, uh, we had or two years ago for Book of Will, we, uh, we had to make it rain paper. Uh, and it's like, cool, we solved the overstage where it needed to rain paper for a certain amount of time. But then we started mechanically training to, to design like paper throwers that would throw it over the house. And it, it's not holding on to a single idea. In the end, instead of this mechanical arm that was throwing something, we just gave it to a crew member and they chucked a bunch of paper out over the house. And it was beautiful. It's not being stuck with this one idea. And if you get stuck on that idea, you never give up and you don't find the best thing. So but it's you just also finding those solutions. when we had to change everything from paper to mm. from the we started it with Tyvek and everything was so loud that then we had to yep. print everything on fabric. So there was this whole like let's completely rework how we're going to do that entire effect at the end of the show halfway through the season. Jenny, gosh, I. Picking things out of my brain like that, I don't know. I think, I can't think of like a specific, I don't know, Richard, I don't, I can, nothing comes to mind. So I'll fill in with, you know, I just realized that I was sick of designers being disappointed by their shiny black floors. So I just made it my mission to, to be the best at shiny black floors that I could possibly be. <laughs> so I am, I, you know, when I came up here and met Rachel and she was like, we, I want to have you teach. And she's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I, I me, I, I don't know, cobalt. And I was like, what do you need? She's like floors. I was like, oh, that's it. And so um, I make a nice, nice shiny black floor. <laughs> yes, I could attest to that. It's very durable and only, and stays shiny. <laughs> I mean, pro problem solving that you all were talking about. I mean, it's, it's being open, it's being flexible. It's, uh, it, yeah. Um, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I cut you off. 
if I'm able to share my screen, I can look at a problem that we're trying to solve right now for the current season. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so, so this is for comedy of errors and it's going to have rotating wall panels for a chase scene that's going to come through. And then the wall panels have to have panels inside of them that need to open up for people to stick their faces through. And then there's going to be doors in the middle that the top and bottom panels need to be able to open for actors to do things. And just figuring out the mechanics about how is this going to rotate? How is this going to uh, stay in place? How do we need to stay it in place? This is kind of what I do as a, as a TD. And this wall also has to have a large piece of trim across the top that falls down. So it's just like this big, complicated thing that has to move, but it needs to be so simple on how we move it and how it's going to operate uh, because it has to be like one person on stage that needs to make all these things happen. And then how do you do that simply, cheaply, and in the amount of time that we have to do and remembering that this has to be removed from the stage in a couple hours and a new thing put on stage. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Rotating that, repertory. That reminds, right? me, that reminds me of something. I remember that uh, Richard's heard this one before that, uh, if you know what this queen is, it's like plastic sheeting, think ET or think a construction site or Dexter, whatever you want. So that type of plastic sheeting was gonna be on a show, lots of scaffolding and uh, the design team was real excited because they found some inherently flame retardant this queen. Great. Well, they wanted me to age it, paint it up. Well, two weeks with the world of resources behind me, whatever I put on this, the minute I changed anything about the surface of it, the surface tension changed and the thing went up like fire. So I had to invent my own plastic. So I had to take China silk, I had to lay down the Visqueen plastic, which is all, you know, it has the wrinkles and folds from when it, which is one of the things that makes it what it is. So we just left it like that. Then we stapled China silk down and then I used clear acrylic with flame retardant in it and just built it up and built it up and built it up, aged it. And then we peeled it off of the plastic and you had the, the point that touched the plastic, it was shiny. And then we had our extreme couture, way too expensive. We never <laughs> got to do the show. Beautiful <laughs> flame retardant plastic. <laughs> wow yeah it's a blend of there's so many different skills that go into this and you're 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 i like to say everything we do is a prototype um because you know when you build a car you like make a prototype and then you make like ten thousand of them when we do a show most of the time you know we make one or a few of something and we make it that one time for this one show to run maybe 60 performances and then we probably never make it again the same way it's always an evolution of some different idea. So there, there is so much that goes into that. I'm always amazed by these stories of like, yeah, we overcame it this way. And the simpler often is the better. We, uh, I'm sure we've all heard the KISS method, right? Keep it simple. Um, and, and that idea of kind of, I left off the last S. Um, I mean, the idea of just like, let's find, let's make sure it's repeatable, inexpensive, fast to make, and you know, sometimes it can't always, it can't always be all those things, but um, yeah, I love those stories. And I forgot about that best, this queen one, Jenny. Thank you. That's, that's really good. Yeah. Um, I just I mean, this kind of lead to, go ahead, Chris. It kind of leads into a point I didn't mention earlier. I see a lot of TVs coming out that don't know how to sew, don't know uh, electrical work, don't know these things. They're so focused on like, I can build scenery and I can draft the scenery and then we're done. Any TD that can sew, can paint, can do all these things because then you can speak the language to the other departments who are going to be doing the actual work but then you can understand where they're coming from in order to make the best decisions to, to support the other departments mm -hmm. so i think a big loss is that uh 20 years ago when you had bob vila uh and norm abrams they didn't simplify things to make sound bites like hgtv so we got to see people really wall plastering really electricaling we got to be nerds about this stuff and that type of depth isn't really offered on public tv as much anymore mm -hmm. yeah yeah cool um you know one thing that may not be clear and and just this group and why i thought it would be really nice to bring the three of you together is is like what like how do we get props and 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 paint and and you know carpentry together um and you know you all often share a designer usually there's one voice one one artistic voice that is, is sort of um 
uh, is giving you all information. And, and Jenny touched on a little bit, you know, prop, not a prop. Um, can, can you all just talk about how the three of you in your positions might collaborate with, with each other? Um, maybe an example or, or uh, Jenny, I know you have a story about me, but, um, <laughs> but if anybody has anything about like how this, how these group works together specifically. I love working with, I love working with a prop shop that wants to work with me. So Kelly, if uh, I'm doing a treatment on the back walls and we want to upholster the chairs with that same pattern, I want to make some of that fabric for you. And if you are overworked because you've gotten an ad and my scenics are washing buckets, maybe we should grain those chairs for you as well, right? Um, Maybe if uh, I've decided to take on all of these tissue paper leaves and I'm uh, underwater, you're going to send me someone for a day or two. Uh, and same with carpentry. I'm going to carve this thing out, but I need someone with a skill saw right behind me who's really good at a skill saw to get this done so my scenics can come in right behind me. And I sort of feel like the more we all keep in touch and talk, the more we can support each other. Uh, that's good. I really don't like people staying in their own shops too much. I always feel like one of the best collaborations that we do on stage with all of us together is a tree. Like when we have to yeah. do a tree, when it's got a welded steel frame that's been covered by the scenics and then props comes in at the end and puts all the leaves on it or all the branches on it. Like that's when we really have to work the closest together and really have some of the best results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Absolutely. think it's really about constant communication. I talk to our chargers every single day, see what's going on there. Uh, with props like if they have a cart that needs to roll across the stage and the stage has a grooved floor ran into that a couple seasons ago i had to fill in certain areas because a table had to sit but it was rocking and we have to come back in and fill in what we put in in order to make sure that it doesn't rot so it's this constant communication between all of these departments very cool yeah integrating systems you know i like i think of it as you know every production is a machine and each one of us you know it represents a piece but but they they have to they have to take each other into account. We're not silos, you know. We're not we're not independent items that that can't um, that can't sort of pay attention to what's going on around us. You got to lift your head and look around a little but bit. But also, I think it might be really good to point out too, like how Jenny and Kelly and Chris would work together and balance their duties might be a little different than another three people because we all have our proclivities and what we like and maybe like our best time of day or like what our specialties are or even just what we just can't stand doing. And if I just really can't stand doing something and Kelly knows that and is like, I got this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to have a much better day so that when one of the carpenters walks through my paint, I'm just not going to be as grumpy. And I feel like that sort of thing is, is the joy of what we do when we get to spend some time in one place together. Great. Wow. Uh, you know, that's, and one of the, I, I think that's really important, you know, uh, Jenny and I worked together for seven years. So we kind of got to, we, we started to understand each other's moods times you know <laughs> loves whatever yeah and one of the challenges of of the festival is that you know 95 percent of our personnel are seasonal including chris and kelly and and we don't get to we get crammed in in a very quick period of time like we just we just have to learn about each other very quickly we have to understand and and give each other you know a lot of space to sort of be part of this environment um I guess this really is to Kelly and Chris. How 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 has that affected you as far as the way you approach the work at the festival versus maybe your jobs where you're you know you're at the other nine months of the year? Yeah, I mean, with the festival, it, it's all about just being open minded. Something changes, don't get upset about it. Things, if something gets cut, or if if some department does something that affects your department, and it, it just it throws things off. It happens. You got to be like, I'm sorry that that happened. Let's move on and keep going and not, and not holding those things uh, over people. It's just this 
constant. I think we're all very good at that. Like something happens, it's like, oh crap, that's my bad. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, sorry, let's move on. And we work on the next project and everything's great. And it's trying to do the best communication we can, but we only get to see and be with each other for a couple months. So we don't have that long full year relationship that we have with someone. So it's just being able to, to, to communicate quickly with somebody in comparison to what I do here at ASU. I'm with my students for four years, for nine months, every single day. And it's like, I have a really good relationship with them. And it's like, I can really openly uh, communicate and, and, and there aren't like things in the way of that communication because I spent so much time understanding who they are and they understand who I am and how we can talk to each other. There's also this longevity of employees at the festival. So there's a lot of us that have worked together now for a number of seasons that it's coming back into those shorthand conversations, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Chris and I worked together for the first time two years ago. So I think he got tired of how much he had to see me because I kept getting <laughs> down to that. Never, never. <laughs> but I'm, you know, I love, it's great to go back and work with different people and see different experiences for that short period of time and then go back to real life. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, and sort of this, you know, this idea of working in these in these short periods of time does relate to that hustle we were talking about a little earlier. And, you know, it's, it's very common in a large in, in a, a large market like New York City, that freelance life and how these same kind of skills of coming into a place, admitting that you made a mistake. Chris, I think that like mm -hmm. absolutely own it, move yeah. on because nothing, you know, don't worry about it. We, we all make mistakes. Um, you know, Jenny, can you relate this a little bit to that that freelance hustle? You hire a lot of people who who work short term for you and stuff. I do. Well, I think it's worth noting that I'm up here talking. the 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 way I title this workshop is "Stage Floors and Managing Expectations." It's actually half of the content because um, what people have in their minds about what they want and what they imagine and uh, you know, and what we can actually produce. We are not factories, we're humans and we're putting liquids onto solids. And so like really learning the language of communication is something that uh, I think the, the hustle gets you good at because you're doing it so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, when I first moved to the city, I, um, I would sometimes be working uh, six or seven jobs at once. And sometimes I would start a crew at one theater, run across Union Square, check in at the second one. And if they were fine, I'd go up to 42nd Street. I'd check in on someone, get the paint, come back. And then I'd, the four hour before rehearsal call would be done everywhere because I was doing not a lot of shop work when I was a non-union painter. I was doing the load in and previews and touch-ups. So uh, I would have, a just a substantial relationship with the designer as they had with the shop, but just in a different way. And as designers got to know me, they'd know what they could lay, let the shop not do and what could be done on site. But like, so my mornings would be full of get it done in four hours, make sure it's heck and dry before anyone gets on there, give the props and stage management people time to get on. Uh, and then uh, I'd spend my afternoons setting up for the next day. Or I'd be, you know, in tiny shops uh, with no supplies. Uh, I'd be uh, taking way too much transportation to a large shop somewhere I've never been in Jersey. Or uh, at first I would do whatever, whatever I got. So when I first got, I used everything theater I had. In my first few years, I did painting, I did wardrobe, I did hair and makeup, I ran shows, and that got me my assisting gigs. And my assisting gigs got me my drop gigs, mm -hmm. which started getting me designer recommendations, which got me my charge jobs, which got me into what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So every one of them, you know, I made it fun. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Found that, another hung up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that idea of learning about the other disciplines and not being overly focused. Chris mentioned it earlier, Kelly, too. I just, you know, learn about other people. You, you'll, you'll connect with more people. You'll understand better as a collaborator, all those great things. Um, I, I could talk to you all forever about this stuff. This has been really fantastic. And I think 
we really we got to some really you know some deep stuff in the middle there and i i hope we can continue this com these kind of conversations because industry wide my hope and i'll just say this is that we do come out on the other end of all of this different than we went in i think it would be a tragedy beyond as much as the tragedy we were experiencing through covid if we didn't come out um, sort of taking on some of these big questions about how we work. So thank you for going there with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's lovely to, you know, it's lovely to be in a room where you see everyone is on the same boat about that. It's just really good, especially in this season right now. Yep. 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 We are very, very grateful. So uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, really grateful for your skill. I'm actually going to snip this and we're going to make sure that uh, te teachers and students get a chance to see this as well. So uh, grateful. I want to recognize the patrons that are online with us right now. Thank you for finding us, even though we had to re-record sometimes, as we just talked about, the world throws things at us and you got to adapt. So we're grateful there. These conversations can continue online. We hope that you comment on Facebook. You can also find this on YouTube. Uh, if you go to our virtual page, excuse me, if you go to bard.org, go down to the bottom of the page, it says virtual festival, and this is where these and many other conversations are located there. So please find those and the others. We're grateful for that and share those with your friends. We also want to thank Cedar City Brian Head and Tourism Bureau. Uh, these would not happen without their sponsorship. So thank you very, very much. And next week, we're really excited about this. In our play seminar, we're going to be talking to Jerry Adler. And if you know Jerry Adler, I might have some fans out there, The Sopranos. This man started as a stage manager on Broadway, and then after that moved to the acting career, and then eventually found his film and television roles as well. And we get to hear and talk to him a little bit about that growth as now he is actually still acting as well. And I think you'll really enjoy this conversation uh, with Jerry Adler. So thank you very much, and we will see you all later. <laughs>